Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. In the past few videos, we've talked about both first and second order chemical reactions, and we saw that those account for a majority of all chemical reactions, so we can use these equations to study a lot of interesting chemistry. But there's still an important question we haven't asked yet. Why are some reactions faster than others? What makes some of them so slow, while others take only a fraction of a second? To answer that question, we need to start by thinking about what happens during a chemical reaction. Back in General Chemistry 1, we saw that almost all chemical reactions involve breaking some bonds and forming new ones. In order to break those bonds, we need energy. Where does that energy come from? We can get that energy from light, but in most chemical reactions, the energy is kinetic energy that comes from collisions between the reactant molecules. For example, here are some molecules that might be reactants in a chemical reaction. They're color-coded according to how much kinetic energy they have. The red ones are moving quickly and have the highest kinetic energy, and the blue ones have the lowest kinetic energy. When two molecules collide, if their combined energy is high enough, it might be possible for a chemical reaction between them to happen. Here's a graph that can help us think about this. The y-axis here is the potential energy of the molecules in the reaction, and the x-axis represents the progress of the reaction. Suppose we have two different reactant molecules, A and B, and they react to form a product called C. This graph shows us what happens to the energy during a reaction. At the beginning of the reaction, the reactants have this much potential energy. In order for the reaction to happen, they'll need to get over this potential energy barrier. That's where the collision comes in. If the molecules are moving quickly enough, they'll have a lot of kinetic energy. Some of that kinetic energy can get transformed into potential energy, and that's what's needed to get over this barrier. If the kinetic energy is too low, the molecules can't get over the barrier, so no chemical reaction happens, and the reactant molecules just bounce off each other. If they do have a high kinetic energy when they collide, enough of that energy can be transformed into potential energy so that the reaction can happen, and we'll get product molecules as a result. So, in order for the reaction to happen, the reactant molecules must gain this amount of potential energy. The difference between these two energies is called the activation energy, and it has the symbol Ea. In this particular example, notice that the products have a lower energy than the reactants. That means that overall, the molecules lose energy in this example. You might remember from the General Chemistry 1 course that when the molecules lose energy during a reaction, we say that the reaction is exothermic. So, what would this curve look like if the reaction were endothermic? In that case, the products would have a higher potential energy than the reactants, like this. Notice that, in both cases, there's still an activation energy barrier that the reactants need to overcome in order to make the reaction happen. But suppose our reactant molecules don't have enough energy to react when they collide. How can we give them more kinetic energy? As you might remember from our discussion of gas laws in General Chem 1, we can increase the kinetic energy by increasing the temperature. When we do that, it's more likely that the reactant molecules will overcome the activation energy barrier, so the rate of the chemical reaction will increase. But think about that. We know that the rate of a chemical reaction is determined by its rate law, which looks like this. You'll notice that this equation doesn't have temperature as part of it, but we just saw that the rate should increase when the temperature goes up. The key is the rate law constant, K. It turns out that K changes when we change the temperature. The person who first figured this out was the Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius, who developed this equation. Here, K is the rate constant, and on the right side is A, which is called the frequency factor. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Then there's E raised to the power negative Ea over r times t. The e here is the same e that we saw when we talked about logarithms in video number 11. If you've forgotten what e means, you might want to go back and watch that video to refresh your memory. Ea is the activation energy, which we talked about just a minute ago. r is the gas law constant, and t is the temperature. 
Arrhenius developed this equation in 1884 as part of his graduate school dissertation, and it was very different from the way that most people at the time thought that chemical reactions should work. The professors who reviewed his dissertation were so sure that his ideas were wrong that they gave him the lowest possible passing grade. It's as though they had given him a D. But within 20 years, his ideas were so important and so widely accepted, he won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1903. Arrhenius was also very interested in the Earth's atmosphere, and he studied the way that the Earth's climate has changed over the years because of changes in the levels of carbon dioxide. Believe it or not, he was the first prominent scientist to realize that CO2 produced by human activity could cause warming of the Earth's climate. Anyway, back to this equation. This is called the Arrhenius equation, and the important thing to notice about it is that it shows us that the rate constant is connected to the temperature and the activation energy. The frequency factor, which is A in this equation, is different for every chemical reaction, and it's usually something that we have to do experiments in order to determine. Let's try using this equation. Suppose we perform a reaction at 25.0 degrees C, in which the rate constant is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2 seconds to the minus 1. The frequency factor is 30.0 seconds to the minus 1. What's the activation energy for this reaction? We'll use the Arrhenius equation we just talked about. We're looking for the activation energy, so we need to plug in everything else in this equation. And we can do it. We know what K, A, R, and T are. We can use the values for K and A from the question. You might remember that R is the gas law constant, which is 0 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over kelvins times moles. But actually, that's not what we want to use in our calculation. The problem is that those units for R won't cancel out property with our other data. For example, this value for R has atmospheres in the unit, and that won't cancel out for us. Neither will liters. If we leave R in these units, we'll get an answer with some very strange units at the end. But fortunately, we can use different units for R. It turns out that R is also equal to 8.314 joules over kelvins times moles. You might remember that a joule is the unit we use for energy. As you'll see in a minute, using this value for R will eventually give us joules as the unit for the activation energy, which makes sense. So we'll use this number for R. T is the temperature. As you just saw, our unit for R has kelvins in it, so that's the unit we should use for the temperature. Remember, to convert Celsius to Kelvin, we add 273.15. So 25 degrees C is 298.15 Kelvin. Now that we've done that, we're ready to solve the problem. We want to get the activation energy, and you can see that it's in the exponent over here. To solve for Ea, we'll need to get this term by itself on the right side of the equal sign. To do that, we'll divide both sides by 30.0. Now we need to get this fraction out of the exponent. From our discussion in video 11, you might remember that we can get rid of the number e by taking the natural logarithm. The natural log of the left side is negative 8.01, so that's what our exponent is equal to. Now we can solve for ea pretty easily we get 19,800 joules per mole. Notice that the kelvins cancelled out in the unit. So our activation energy is 19,800 joules per mole. That tells us that in order for this reaction to happen, the reactant molecules must collide hard enough that 19,800 joules per mole of kinetic energy can be converted into potential energy. As we saw earlier, if the molecules don't have enough energy, we can give the molecules more energy by raising the temperature. That's what we'll want to do next, find out how changing the temperature changes the rate of the reaction. But that'll need to wait for the next video. In that video, we'll look at a couple of different ways to make the reaction faster, including raising the temperature. I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, have a good week.